Today we're going to talk about advanced pulmonary ultrasound. At this point you should have seen the lecture already on basic pulmonary ultrasound including pneumothorax, pleural effusions, and pulmonary edema. This talk will expand on that talk and remind you of some of the key points. The objectives of today's discussion will be to review the long ultrasound fundamentals that we just mentioned. We will also look at ways we can use pulmonary ultrasound and pleural ultrasound to advance our diagnostic skills at the bedside. There are two different probes we can use and we often use when looking at the lungs. The first is the phased array low frequency probe. Some people call it the cardiac probe. But essentially it's a, a low frequency probe which gives you high degree of penetration but not a great deal of resolution. This is best when we are looking at pulmonary edema, uh, deeper effusions, consolidations, and also surveying the uh, landscape for potential procedure planning such as thoracentesis. In contrast, the linear probe is a higher frequency probe which gives you a great deal of detail but not a great deal of depth. We use this to evaluate the pleural line for pneumothorax as well as to allow for real-time guidance of our procedures. When you're having difficulty obtaining an image of the lungs, it's uh, often frustrating. The lungs themselves are uh, fairly impossible to see in a normal aerated lung because air will scatter ultrasound waves. But in addition, there are other things that can interfere with our picture. These include subcutaneous emphysema, poor patient positioning, um, overlying obstructions such as the EKG pads, um, the monitor clips, and if you're not using enough gel, you will get air in between the probe and the skin, and this can interfere with your picture. Lastly, make sure you have the correct probe for the purpose of your scan. There are several key probe positions. The indicator uh, for, the, for the evaluation of the anterior chest should go towards the head. This is the orientation marker. And anteriorly, we look at the sagittal um, a sagittal orientation, a cephalocaudad orientation, intersecting two ribs and the pleural line beneath. Laterally, with the probe indicator again towards the head, we achieve a coronal picture. And it's important to scan all eight lung zones to uh, evaluate for a complete chest exam. We have two anterior lung zones on the right and left, um, two posterior lateral lung zones on the right and left. All zones should be equally evaluated and it doesn't take but a few seconds each. Anteriorly is the best place we look for pneumothorax because when a patient is supine this is where the extra pleural air will be seen. Posterior laterally uh, we can best see consolidations and effusions because of the gravity dependence of these and in all zones, we should be able to see extracapillary lung water or extravascular lung water equally well. For instance, if a patient has pulmonary edema, this should be diffuse. So going back to the two fundamental questions, is the lung parenchyma normal or not? And the underlying questions that you're essentially asking are A lines present and are B lines present. Is the evaluation of these artifacts that is created by the interfaces with different acoustical impedances that gives you clues to what the underlying lung pathology may be. A lines again, as a reminder, are horizontal, horizontal reverberation artifact. B lines are vertical reverberation artifact. With A lines, we are looking at a horizontal reverberation artifact that originates from the pleural line. What happens here is the ultrasound waves encounter the pleural line, which is adjacent to air. So these two adjacent areas, which, which have very different acoustical impedances, will set up an internal reverberation at that interface. Some of the waves end up coming back to the probe as a reflection off of the air in a delayed fashion, and then the probe interprets that as a deeper structure with that, with that uh, appearance. 
So we see the A lines in both normal lungs and in pneumothorax. What we have here are two rib shadows, the VPPI, which stands for visceral parietal pleural interface, and an A line, which is a reverberation of the VPPI. Also, you'll note that A lines are spaced in the multiples of the chest wall pleural line distance. You will see this orientation and distance repeated deeper and deeper. If you have a deeper picture, you'll be able to see repeat repetitions of this at the same distance. Once you've noted whether they're A lines, uh, we move on to the next phenomenon, B lines. So if you have absence of A-lines, we think about something being abnormal. A-lines should be there in normally aerated lung. If they are not there, then something in the lung has replaced the air. And that something can be anything from blood to alveolar edema, infection, contusion, tumor, and so forth. These substances will transmit waves unlike air. It's important to go back over basic lung anatomy so we can understand the origination of some of these artifacts. You'll note that the interlobular septae that come up to the pleural line are situated approximately 7 millimeters apart in most people, while the alveolar sacs are approximately 3 millimeters apart. You should note that difference for being able to understand the different types of B lines. Fluid that collects in these areas will create vertically oriented artifacts that are spaced similarly. For example, we have normal lung parenchyma with the bronchioles and the alveolar sacs. And next to it, we can appreciate pulmonary edema. What we have here are fluid filled sacs and thickening of these interstitial areas, thickening of the interlobular septi. What happens is fluid that's trapped in these interlobular areas of thickening gets trapped, uh, ultrasound waves get trapped, and reverberations are set up. B lines are essentially the ultrasound equivalent of radiological curly B lines. You can see here how these, B, these uh, curly B lines come up to the surface perpendicularly. There are essentially two types of B lines. First is spaced approximately seven millimeters apart from the pleural line, and the second is three millimeters apart, and this coincides with whether the fluid is trapped in the interstitium or whether the fluid is trapped in the alveoli. The three millimeter spacing or confluent B lines is, is the, radi the ultrasound equivalent of the radiological finding on a CT scan of ground glass. The low frequency phased array probe has a small footprint, but has the capacity to display a broad, deep field. However, the splaying of the ultrasound beam results in loss of resolution in the deeper structures. In contrast, the high frequency linear probe has a larger footprint and will display a great deal of detail, but at the expense of depth. Since the ultrasound beam does not expand laterally, the resolution at the surface is similar to the resolution in the deeper planes. When we use this high frequency probe, it's a very excellent view of the pleural line in sliding. You will see some examples of this. So now we're going to use this high frequency image to analyze artifact. We can't see the lung itself, but we can see the artifact created by the interfaces between tissues that have very different impedances, such as pleural line and lung. Here is the visceral parietal pleural interface, and what we're seeing here is the sliding sign. And it tells us that the visceral parietal interface is intact. In other words, the visceral uh, pleura is adjacent to the parietal pleura, and they're sliding against each other. You can appreciate these very small B lines that show you the motion. The motion at the sliding sign uh, at the pleural interface looks a bit like ants crawling across or shimmers. We have very minor B lines here, and there's an A line, because this lung is mostly aerated. In the findings of a pneumothorax, 
we have the probe oriented towards the head, but if the lung falls away from the chest wall, then we have a pocket of air in between the probe and the lung, and therefore we will not see that sliding because the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura are no longer together. Instead, we see something like this. What we have here is no sliding at this interface, no B lines, small B lines going back and forth, and we do have an A line because this is A for air. A lines can be seen in either aerated lungs or in pneumothorax. It doesn't tell you where the air is. It can be either in the lung or outside the lung, but it does tell you there's air. Next we're going to talk about pleural effusions. Here we choose the coronal orientation with the indicator towards the head. We have also chosen the low frequency probe so we can get a deeper view and not as much detail. Here's the diaphragm. What you'd like to do is place your probe at that interface where the diaphragm separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. You can also notice that the vertebrae are more visible in the thorax than in situations where there is no fluid in the lung. This is because pleural fluid conducts ultrasound beams, but air does not. So structures that are deep to the fluid can be seen and actually are enhanced. This is something we call posterior acoustic enhancement. If there were air in this lung and no fluid around it, you would not be able to see those vertebral bodies. Here's an example of a chest with no fluid. And what we're seeing here is something called a mirror sign. Mirror image artifact is when you have ultrasound beams coming through the liver or the spleen reflecting off of the diaphragm and not able to go through because the lung on the other side will scatter the ultrasound beam, reflecting off the diaphragm and coming back to the probe in a delayed fashion. When this happens, the probe reads that delayed fashion as liver tissue or spleen tissue deeper to the diaphragm, and therefore it appears that there's liver on both sides of the diaphragm. You'll also notice that you can't see the shadows of the vertebral bodies above the diaphragm. This is because ultrasound waves are being scattered by the air. We call this the spine sign, where no vertebral shadows can be seen above the diaphragm, and that helps us appreciate that there is no fluid above the diaphragm. Moving on to pneumonia. About 88% of consolidations, 88 to 90% of consolidations can be seen with ultrasound. The characteristic features we look for are hypoechoic consolidations with hyperechoic lines running through. For example, here you have this hypoechoic lung, which is dark because it's been infiltrated with some sort of fluid, whether it's pus or atelectasis. And then we see the hyperechoic horizontal lines that represent the bronchograms. Here's another example with a low frequency probe showing the diaphragm, the pleural fluid, and the lung which is compressed. Here again you can see bright white hyperechoic structures and this would be something we could call hepatization of the lung, meaning that the lung has become has taken on more of a solid organ appearance. So again we're going back to our artifact analysis. We have A lines and B lines, sliding sign and mirror images. When we follow these throughout the lung examination, we can extrapolate what may be going on underneath. What's really important to note is where these artifacts are located because it will tell you a lot about the underlying pathology. Daniel Lichtenstein of France is one of the key fathers of pulmonary ultrasound and critical care. He developed the BLUE protocol to di diagnose causes of acute respiratory failure. He did this by taking patients with a diagnosis of acute respiratory failure and scanning their chests. He did this alongside the usual diagnostic tests, including chest x-rays and CTs. What he found was that he recognized certain patterns of artifact of A lines and B lines and sliding so and so forth, 
that correlated with the ultimate clinical and radiological di diagnoses. This was an observational study over four years, and it took all of the patients submitted to his ICU with one sonographer scanning their chest. He created this algorithm to help lead you to the diagnosis earlier. First, he started with lung sliding, and he looked to see if it was present or absent. If lung sliding was present, then the next thing he looked for was whether there was a predominance of B lines or a predominance of A lines. If there were a predominance of B lines and sliding was present, then he found that these patients ended up with pulmonary edema as their diagnosis. If there was a predominance of A-lines, which re represent air, and there was lung sliding, then he would say that's not pneumothorax, but instead this is an aerated lung. After that, he would look at the veins. If he finds with the DVT evaluation a thrombosed vein, then pulmonary embolism was fit many times the diagnosis. If the veins were clear but the lung was aerated and the patient was in respiratory failure, then he looked to see if there was any posterior uh, pleural fluid, a syndrome called PLAPS. If there were, then this was often a posterior pneumonia. If there were not, then COP or COPD or asthma became the diagnosis. On the other side, if there was no lung sliding, but there was a predominance of Bs, then this was pneumonia, and, and the lack of lung sliding was felt to be due to adhesions. If the lung sliding was absent and there was a predominance of A-lines, then the diagnosis often was pneumothorax. Here's some examples. If you have a predominant A profile with A-lines on both sides and sliding, then this turned out to be COPD, uh, reactive airway disease, PE, or a pneumonia in the posterior fields. Without sliding, pneumothorax was often the diagnosis. For predominance of Bs, bilaterally, the common outcome was pulmonary edema. And something called an AB profile, where you have B lines on one side and A lines on the other, or unilateral uh, predominance of one over the other, with if there were reduced sliding and an effusion, then the outcome, pneumonia. Just to mention uh, the utility of PA catheters compared to ultrasound for trying to understand the causes of respiratory failure, a chest article recently looked at A lines and B lines to see what it could tell us about pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. There were 102 patients who had a PA catheter. All of them had an ultrasound of the thorax performed. The findings were that if there were an A line predominance, then the wedge pressure was always less than 18. B-line predominance did not allow you to make a conclusion about the wedge because cardiogenic pulmonary edema and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema can often appear similar. So looking at the evidence, there is a great deal of evidence supporting the use of chest ultrasound for the diagnosis of many conditions, including pneumothorax, pneumonia, and ARDS. For example, chest ultrasound has been shown to be superior to x-rays and physical examination for differentiating CHF from COPD. This is often a problem with our patients who come in who have a history of both. They come in short of breath and you're trying to figure out what you need to do with them. The days are numbered that we will admit a patient with a known COPD history and a CHF history where we choose to treat their dyspnea with a shotgun approach to cover both the CHF and the COPD bases because we're not clear what the predominant issue is on admission. What we can do now is we can scan the chest and see, do they have a predominance of A-lines? Well, that's more likely to be a COPD exacerbation and a predominance of B-lines bilaterally. Again, pulmonary edema. It's also been shown that chest ultrasound is superior to plain films for diagnosis of pneumothorax, and this is in a supine patient. Ultrasound is much more sensitive 
than chest x-ray and similarly specific as chest x-ray. If you think about it, a patient who has a pneumothorax in the supine position, the air is anterior and therefore an, a chest x-ray is not likely to show you a pleural line. And the average time to diagnosis of pneumothorax with ultrasound is just in, on the order of a few minutes, whereas often there's a delay that can be significant in the patient's management if you use chest x-ray. Here's an example. What's wrong with this picture? Well, it doesn't look like anything. Your patient is short of breath. It looks like they may have some fluid overload, but you would completely miss the underlying reason for this patient's shortness of breath, which is seen on CT. This patient has large anterior pneumothorax, which was not appreciated on the chest x-ray. And when scanned, what you would find would be on the normal side, where the lung was inflated, you have a sky ocean beach picture. And on the positive side, where the pneumothorax exists, the beach has disappeared. This is a review from the prior lecture, where it tells you that when there is sliding and the lung is moving back and forth, you get this difference in the tissues, where you see sky and ocean, which is from the muscle layer, but the beach is the lung sliding back and forth. If the lung is dropped out of the picture, you don't see anything below that pleural line because of the air, and it looks the entire thing looks like a barcode or the stratosphere. Chest ultrasound has definitely been shown to improve the safety and efficacy of pleural-based procedures. You'll notice that you can tap out what you think is dullness and where a pleural effusion should be, but you might be wrong and instead place the chest tube directly into someone's liver. When you have the opportunity to use an ultrasound to localize fluid in real time, there's really no reason not to use it. So here we go with a diagnostic dilemma. Shortness of breath. Do we have CHF, ARDS, COPD, any number of things? What's going on with this patient? In order to get a jump start on the appropriate therapy, use your ultrasound. Example number one, patient is acutely short of breath, and this is what you find. We have an IVC that's plethoric, not with any respiratory variation that's significant, bilateral B lines. In addition, you can appreciate with the cardiac window that the left ventricular function is severely reduced. So the combination of bilateral diffuse B lines, a full inferior vena cava, and the poor function leads you to the diagnosis of a CHF exacerbation as the cause for that patient's respiratory distress. Another example, patient short of breath. And what we see is a very hyperdynamic heart with a little bit of right ventricular enlargement and bilateral A lines. Well, what is the diagnosis that can combine right ventricular strain and normally aerated lungs? If you're thinking PE, then you're thinking correctly. Look down in the legs, place compression venography, and if you cannot compress the vein, then you are looking at PE. Another example, patient arrives to the emergency room, short of breath. Your ultrasound on the right is, has a predominance of A lines. Your ultrasound on the left has this B line pattern all the way through. And even with a high frequency probe where you're looking at the pleural line, you can see multiple B lines originating from the pleural line indicating intra, extravascular lung water in the interlobular septi. Chest x-ray might appear such as this. and you would be right to call this pneumonia. So in summary, pulmonary ultrasound is actually not new. We just newly appreciate what we can do to appreciate artifacts and help us lead to diagnosis early. The evidence supports the use of chest ultrasound and there's many advantages of ultrasound over the traditional studies of the chest, including decreased ionized radiation, decreased time to results, and decreased patient discomfort.